The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from safedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning everyday spare change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the Sats card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin Standard Sats card, which carries the Bitcoin Standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin Standard. Use the code Bitcoin Standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Peter St. Ange. Peter is an economist at the Heritage Foundation, a fellow at the Mises Institute, and he makes a lot of videos and writes and uh, makes a lot of tweets as well about Bitcoin, hyper-Bitcoinization, dollarization, de-dollarization, fractional reserve banking, and other fun topics that we love to chat about in this podcast. Peter and I have spent quite a bit of time talking back and forth on Twitter, um, making fun of a lot of common enemies. And it's a pleasure to bring him on board to move our uh, Twitter posting onto the audio and video realm. So Peter, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me on, Safety. I'm excited for the next evolution here in our content journey. <laughs> All right. So it's been a very eventful few weeks or months yes. or years, I guess, <laughs> particularly the last few weeks. We've had a lot going on and you've been making a lot of noise about it. And I think you've gotten plenty of attention for uh, some of your ideas. Yeah, obviously, um, you know, you are here. Uh, so people can guess 
we do share a lot of the same perspectives on things. Some will call it bias, you know, alternatively, you could just call, call it correct. Uh, so you've, you, you've uh, spoken recently a lot about the de-dollarization issue. This is something I wanted to talk to you about, as well as uh, fractional reserve banking. So I'd say we begin with de-dollarization. What are your thoughts on that? Is the world de-dollarizing? Yeah, so it has been going on, of course, for decades, uh, almost immediately after Bretton Woods, right? Bretton Woods was implemented at sort of the high water mark, probably of all time for the United States. The United States absolutely dominated the world economy. They more or less had every country on earth in their pocket, except for the controlled opposition in the Soviet Union. Uh, the, the US really ran the entire globe. And of course, ever since then, you know, Europe, uh, Japan, then China, all of these countries have gotten back on their feet, have grown their economies to the point where the US, I think after World War II, it was something like half of world GDP. And now it's down to somewhere around 20%. So the US has become less dominant in the world. Uh, and then of course, Nixon, you know, dramatically changed the deal on the US dollar. So the dollar went from by far the you know most solid currency in the world to just one of the gang. And so when you put those together, the US has been constantly losing market share, losing so-called dollar dominance, meaning the uh, percent of international currency usage that's made up by the dollar. So it's been using, losing that sort of percent by percent dripping away. And I think that one of the you know, things that really put that process into the news again. Uh, you had mentioned about a year ago uh, on an episode about the Ukraine conflict. And within that, you know, of course, the U.S. seized the Russian central bank uh, assets, including U.S. dollars. You know, even during the Cold War, there had been almost a gentleman's agreement. You know, the U.S. and the Soviets were having proxy wars all over the world. The more the merrier. It's good for business. And even during that time, never did the U.S. contemplate seizing the dollars of the enemy. And the reason, of course, is it is, it is in our interest that <laughs> everything in the world, including cartel transactions, including arms sales to our enemies, we want everything in the world to be standardized on the dollar because that gives us the exorbitant privilege of printing up green pieces of, pieces of paper and making foreigners give us uh, useful things for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, we, uh, you mentioned we had this uh, earlier episode where we discussed it. And I think, uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll say something that's probably not going to be uh, what my listeners usually expect to hear from me. But I generally don't feel very confident with uh, all of these predictions of the dollar's doom. You, you know, you noticed a few weeks ago, Balaji Srinivasan, I think, I hope I'm not butchering the pronunciation of his name, but he's a, a prominent VC in Silicon Valley and in the shitcoin world. And he came out with a tweet saying Bitcoin is going to hit uh, $1 million in 90 days and he even bet money on that, which I think was an extremely misguided uh, bet because uh, he bet $1 million versus one Bitcoin. So uh, he basically <laughs> stand, st stands to make very little if he's correct and he stands to lose a lot if he's uh, wrong. So like he could have just bought futures and made a lot more <laughs> money. But I guess... The you know, the point was to raise alarm about this. Yes. Now, I wrote a thread about uh, I wrote a thread about why I think that's not the case, and primarily, it's he says you know there's a banking crisis, and so because of the banking crisis, the currency is going to get destroyed. But you know, the U.S. dollar is uh, not going to get destroyed in three months. I think if you've been through hyperinflation. You know, you look at the chart and you see toward the end of the hyperinflation before the currency dies. It does skyrocket. It does go parabolic. But that's really, it takes a lot of time relatively to get to that point. So even in a place like Lebanon, where the government is extremely dysfunctional, extremely corrupt, where you know they have a massively uh, overfunded train authority and they have zero trains in the entire country. <laughs> in that kind of country, it's true. And in that kind of country, even after the banks started uh, basically declared bankrupt. I mean, they didn't declare bankruptcy, but they effectively became bankrupt because they could no longer redeem the dollar deposits that they had on hand. And the, the exchange rate of the currency started to deteriorate against the dollar. There, It took a couple of years for the uh, exchange rate to fall 
at a very fast pace. And even it's it's been almost four years, you know, it was July 2019 when 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 a black market rate emerged, when there was an official rate and a black market rate. And since then, uh, the lira has lost somewhere in the range of about 97, 98% of its value against the US dollar. But still, it's really only in the last six months or so that this has really taken off in a parabolic way. So even in a place like Lebanon, with all of those mm-hmm. things, it takes a while for the currency to collapse. And even when it's, it might seem obvious for an economist or an Austrian economist, at least, that, yep, clearly they're bankrupt and clearly they won't be able to meet their liabilities. People are very used to their government money and uh, old habits die hard. And, you know, that picture of the uh, horse or the donkey that gets tied to a plastic chair. There's a lot of that, that people just... Uh, are are so used to getting tied and not moving like these horses or donkeys that you could tie them onto a a, a plastic chair that is uh, very light and very easy for them to move, but they still won't move because they are used to being chained. And I think national currencies are a little bit like that. So the point I'm trying to make from this long tangent is that once you kind of get Bitcoin and you realize just how corrupt and defunct and dysfunctional the current fiat monetary system is, it's impossible to escape the conclusion that it's all going to fall apart next week or in the next three months. It's just, it's, it, it happened to me in 2008. It happens to everybody I know, you know, that when they first get it, when they first take the Austrian pill, there's always, oh, it's all going to fall apart next week. And then it doesn't. And then right. you just think, all right, maybe the week after that, and then maybe the week after that. And so the collapse of the dollar is one of those things. So for me, like 2008, it was obvious the dollar is going to be toast and it's done. And here we are 15 years later, we're still seeing obituaries of the dollar every day. I think there's a case to be made that, you know, the viewpoint of the dollar is going to die has gone from being the kind of fringe position to almost being the dominant position. More and more people seem to seem to be adopting this and accepting it. And I think... I think there's a lot to be said for why that might not be the case. And particularly, it's just that the fiat alternatives are infinitely worse than the dollar and infinitely worse in a way that makes them, you know, it's it's not even a matter of uh, choice. Governments can't just switch to any other obvious alternative. They're stuck with the dollar almost. You know, when you first learn about Bitcoin, when you first learn about the, you know, sort of Ponzi industrial complex uh, of fiat, it is tempting to think that it's all going to collapse. And of course, I think what's going on here is that we know how the book ends. We do not know how each chapter ends, nor do we know how many chapters there are. And, you know, indeed, in the 1970s, so we're talking, what, over 50 years ago, a lot of people thought that that was the end. Uh, We had inflation in double digits. It looked very stubborn. Volcker was, I think, very surprising, right? So Paul Volcker in the US raised interest rates to almost 20%. This had been unprecedented. I don't think this was on anybody's bingo card at the time, particularly since he was appointed by a deeply left-wing president. So I think that was surprising to poor Jimmy Carter, who lost the next election. But at any rate, the point being that, you know, A, things happen. <laughs> things happen along the way that none of us can predict. B, the system has an enormous amount of inertia built into it. You know, you were talking about the donkey on the plastic chair. And, you know, again, when people first read about it, they say, well, people are just irrational. You know, we have to wake people up. You know, maybe they cite the one good thing that Keynes ever said, which is uh, the joke about the market being irrational longer than you can stay solvent. But, you know, as economists, of course, we, we look at it from the point of view of the individuals involved. As, as Austrian economists, I should say, most economists, unfortunately, do not. And from the perspective of the individual involved, there are enormous transaction costs, there are cognitive costs. Uh, you see people coming to Bitcoin all the time who say, my God, you know, is this thing even real? What is this thing? And it takes time. You know, we, I, I think you and I both, when we're orange pilling people, you kind of tell them, buy a little bit, go to, you know, Swan Bitcoin or whatever, uh, dollar cost average in, just kind of get used to it, read a little bit. Uh, it takes a long time to break out of that uh, for a lot of people for perfectly rational reasons, right? So sort of on a biological basis, we are paid in survival to overestimate risks, right? So, you know, if there's some rustling in the forest and you think it's a tiger, you know, evolutionarily useful 
to pretend it's a tiger, whether or not it's a tiger, right? The guy who did not do that, the guy who was perfectly rational and said, ah, calm down, calm down. Statistically, it's just, you know, whatever, uh, a leaf falling. Well, he is no longer here. So (laughs) he's not part of the conversation anymore. He didn't make it. Now, at the same time, you know, so again, looking at sort of the perspective of the people involved, we can kind of play devil's advocate and say, okay, well, the de-dollarization, the death of the dollar, what is that up against? And, you know, number one is the network effect, right? So there are massive, enormous network effects built into the system on an individual level, right? This is largely what sustains national currencies is that, you know, even in a country like El Salvador or, you know, really it takes a sort of Zimbabwe level incompetence to break people out of the built-in network effect of whatever currency they happen to be using, Uh, And that's also true on a global basis. And then meanwhile, the other point that you mentioned, which is the cleanest dirty shirt, right? So the U.S. doesn't or the U.S. dollar does not have to be perfect. It just has to be better than the euro or the Canadian dollar or the Japanese yen or the Swiss franc, which is not what it used to be. And so, you know, really, it's sort of um, a convoy system where until the day when all fiat dies, you know, people are going to naturally sort of gravitate, especially in times of crisis, they're going to move towards the dollar. We saw that in 2008, where the crisis itself was coming out of the United States. And so naively, you might have said, well, this is going to be quite bad for the dollar. And of course, it was not. Right. (laughs) On the contrary, it was something that scared people all over the world. It it launched a uh, sovereign crisis in Europe. As a result, paradoxically, all of these people moved into the U.S. dollar. And so, you know, this is, I mean, I think as we get towards the death of fiat, one of the paradoxical things we'll see is that even if the source of that is coming from the U.S., in other words, say U.S. inflation with all the other countries uh, sort of keeping up with it or seeing it as a license, even if the source of the end, the source of the crisis is coming from the U.S., we may see the dollar get stronger leading towards the end because you know it's sort of like um, it feasts on the corpses of the you know weaker currencies along the way. So every little you know Ecuadorian or uh, I mean Ecuador literally uses the dollar now, so it's a good example. But you know every um, uh, middling currency that dies along Zimbabwean, the way, Zimbabwean, yeah, Argentinian, bingo, Greek. exactly, yeah. Uh, so it, paradoxically, I think the dollar will be the last to go in in sort of a meta sense of you know uh, when when Bitcoin. Um, but in terms of what's happening now, I think that more accepting the sort of black wa- black swan scenario where China actually implements a gold-backed currency, uh, accepting that deus ex machina, I think the most likely scenario for a de-dollarization would be death by a thousand cuts. So, you know, China more or less bribes African countries and uh, Middle Eastern and Latin America. It just kind of goes down its list very methodically and tries to pay country subsidies to shift off the dollar. And each one of those, you know, puts a sort of very small uh, price hit or, or buying power hit onto the dollar. And then I suppose their hope would be that if you put enough of those together, then you can tip the scale and you can start moving the dollar enough that Japanese banks and all of these sort of legitimate uh, holders start to question it. So outside of some, you know, either catastrophic policy shift from the US, and again, the US relative to other countries, uh, or that, you know, gold deus ex, I think that would really be, you know, the, the sort of the smartest move for China. Now, of course, China is probably the only country in the world that is capable of that kind of disciplined long march. You know, if we look at what they do with Taiwan, with the uh, diplomatic isolation that it imposes on Taiwan, they're, they're really quite impressive as an adversary. <laughs> you know, the US kind of pops in and does a couple sound bites and uh, hands out some money and then goes home. No, China is extremely disciplined. So I think it's within reality that China could do that kind of methodological march, just stamp on and on, you know, reduce the US dollar share in the IMF, just one after the other, cut off the exits the way it's been doing with Taiwan. But as you say, that's going to be a very long process, not something that's going to happen in three weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think my my view on it is that it's uh, for a very long time, it almost seemed as if simply governments deciding, hey, you know, we don't want to play with the dollar anymore was going to be uh, a, a death sentence for the dollar. And I mean, it was it almost seems as if, you know, it's just that the U.S. has all these puppet regimes all over the world. 
And if those puppet regimes just decide to stop being U.S. puppets, uh, then they're going to switch away from the dollar and then the dollar collapses. But I think, you know, with time, as my hair gets grayer and uh, <laughs> my emotions quiet down and my <laughs> brain Never. hopefully takes over. <laughs> Although, who knows? Uh, but like with time, you know, you start to think maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I think uh, the last... Uh, decade and a half have been an illustration of this. I mean, also, let's not forget, I mean, people were saying this stuff in the 70s, as you mentioned earlier, that this has always been on the cards, you know, the de-dollarization. In fact, it's like, uh, if I was there in 1971, I would have expected that it would be gone by 1972. And here we are, 53 years, 52 years later, and it's still uh, ticking along. Doesn't mean it'll keep going on forever, but I think if I were to make the case for why the dollar survives this scares and why in fact it stays stronger i'd say first of all money is a winner take all market so mm-hmm. there's always everybody wants to have the money that has the most liquidity and i think this is something that i understand from bitcoin and something that i'm always trying to communicate to people who you know when they are complaining about well nobody uses bitcoin to buy coffee and my answer is it's always about cash balances it's what matters is who has the big which form of money has the most cash balances the form of money that has the most cash balances is the form of money that you want to take as a form of payment as a seller because you realize that your potential customers have the most of this one particular money and then It's also the one that you want to hold the most, which is more important because it's the one that you can spend the most because all the people that you're going to be buying things from are more likely to have this money as the one that they want to accept. So it really, the cash balances are the thing that matters the most. And so the more liquidity you have in a form of money, the more liquidity you attract. And because of this, you know, in the fiat standard, having like taken a closer look at how the fiat system works, the way that I described it is essentially all other currencies, all non-dollar fiat currencies are essentially just US dollar plus country risk. Yep. If you look at the history, none of these currencies have appreciated more than the US dollar. Basically, nothing has uh, gone up against the US dollar in the long term. Nothing, I mean, maybe there's a couple of currencies. There's a few Gulf currencies that have gone up 10, 20, 30% in the long term, but nothing substantive. You know, there's no currency that has beaten the, uh, and, and there's no big major currency that has beaten the dollar in the long term. So you're not getting any extra appreciation. And you're getting a lot less liquidity and a lot less saleability, ultimately. You, you can spend all the other national currencies a lot less than the dollar. So in a sense, the only reason these things exist are is because their central banks hold a lot of dollars and a lot of treasuries and can maintain an exchange rate against the dollar. In other words, the way that I see it, I think the anomaly is not that we have a world in which the dollar is the dominant reserve currency. The more that I get into Bitcoin and the more that I think about monetary economics and the more that I think about it from the perspective of Menger, the more it looks to me like the real anomaly is that we have all these other national currencies. The real weird thing is not that the dollar is so dominant. The real weird thing is that the dollar is so dominant and all these other national shitcoins continue to exist. And it makes no sense why they would exist. But the only reason they do exist is because their governments have all these U.S. treasuries that allow them to essentially keep their currency alive by making a market. The central banks can make a market in those dollars. And as long as they're able to maintain that market and maintain the ability to keep you know, redeeming their currency for dollar at the exchange rate, that is pre- prevalent on the market, then their currency survives. But effectively, it's just second layer dollar. It's basically like a side chain on the dollar. Yeah, yeah, that's a great metaphor. And you know, the way that that's experienced by the individuals in those countries, of course, is that from their perspective, their national currency has superior liquidity in that country, right? So if I go to Canada and I try to spend dollars to buy dinner, then I'm going to get penalized. <laughs> uh, there's going to be various transaction costs imposed on that. On the other hand, you know, if you are a large pool of capital and 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 you are storing money somewhere like uh, you know, Mexico might be a, a more obvious example, but you know, buying dinner in Mexico with dollars, they don't want it. Okay, they want pesos. Uh, you get penalized. On the other hand, uh, parking you know billions of dollars in Mexico, there <laughs> you want to go with dollars. Everybody else wants you to go with dollars, and so you've got almost these two 
you know, it's almost like the era in the West when the elite spoke Latin and everybody else spoke vernacular. So you've got this vernacular currency for the plebes, and then you've got the dollar as kind of the Latin uh, of the world. It's not a very good Latin, but anyway, it's the best Latin they've got. <laughs> yeah. So I think I've, if I were to keep making the the the, the, the bull case, it would be right. what you just said. Then there's um, you know the Mexican billionaire is not going to hold pesos. The, the Mexican day laborer is going to be paying with pesos. But ultimately, the cash balances are going to be in dollars. And the reason for that, I think, ultimately, I mean, again, it's all the same framework that I use in studying Bitcoin standard and uh, the fiat standard, saleability. You know, you want to think about money. What gives money its moneyness is saleability. It's the, it's the quintessential property of money. And you can think about it across time and across space. So saleability across space is unmatched for the dollar because you can send it anywhere. And it's, it's, it's something that you can enter and exit with significant volume without much penalization. And that's because of the original point we mentioned, which is the very large liquidity. So if you're a Saudi sovereign wealth fund, and you know you you sold something for five billion dollars or you want to buy five billion dollars you need something where you can get in and out at that kind of volume and there just aren't that many things like not even apple stock one of the biggest stocks in the world or amazon you can't just buy or sell five billion dollars in a pop and not affect the price i think this is really the key thing if you want to take this money to the market because you want to get rid of a big chunk of it are you going to shoot yourself in the foot effectively by making the money itself drop its value? Because you have such a sizable volume that if you were using Apple stock as money, you get into you, you decide that you need to sell five billion today, and then that's going to have an effect on the price. So at the end of the day, you've only got four billion. So you'd lose exactly. just because you're going right. in and out of something wherein you have significant volume compared to it. And so the only swimming pool that's good enough for you not to make a splash that empties the swimming pool, basically, mm -hmm. nice. is the dollar. And that's, that's effectively, or specifically, it is the treasuries. It's the treasury bonds. That's where you can go in $5 billion and come out with $5 billion and barely make a ripple. It's like a big, giant ocean compared to all these other national currencies, just like you know, somewhere between a little... Uh, tiny uh, baby kitty pool uh, to uh, maybe, you know, a small Olympic pool at best. And so, you know, you can't put objects that are very large in Olympic swimming pools. So this, this, this is ultimately what it comes down to because of all this extra liquidity, all the excess liquidity, well, I shouldn't say excess, but all the very large amount of liquidity that exists in the dollar, which is unmatched anywhere. And that's what you have to beat. So it's it's very easy to just go and say, yeah, we, we don't want to use the dollar anymore. And like all these governments are constantly making noises about it. And I guess it probably works amongst diplomats because most of them don't really understand economics. And so for politicians, you know, let's tell the Americans that we want to get rid of the dollar. And I'm sure there are Americans who, uh, you know, there are American officials who get worried about this. Oh, no, the Saudis and the Indians are going to trade with rupees from now on. They're not. It doesn't matter if they denominate their trade in rupees. The Saudi central bank isn't going to hold rupees because they don't need rupees for anything but trade with India. So they don't need to hold the rupees. They can just you know, calculate and settle at the end of the day. And if they do get paid in rupees, they're going to sell them immediately because they want to hold something that is liquid. They want to increase their position and think that is most liquid. They don't want to take on you know, they don't want to have to start worrying about Indian monetary policy in their reserves. So there's no way the Saudis are going to hold Indian reserves. There's no way the Indians are going to hold Saudi reserves. Both of them hold treasuries in reserve. So they can denominate their trade in rupees or rials or potatoes or anything. Ultimately, they both hold U.S. treasuries in reserves, and that's what gives it the value. And I think it's, it's very simple and very easy for a diplomat to say, hey, we're not happy with your... Um, with your currency, we're going to start using our own currency. It's very difficult for them to find another $25 trillion market like the treasuries where they could come in and out uh, with volume. Right. And, you know, for a lot of these sort of Chinese yuan usages, especially uh, China literally offers them discounts. I mean, they offer like bargain deals, you know, and, and this is almost like the uh, 2018 ICO where, oh, look, we've got this massive liquidity. And well, yes, if you're subsidizing something, then yes, people will take advantage. They'll come in, they'll grab the coupons, and then they will forget about you, about your Chuck E. Cheese token. So, you know, China, 
they are apparently willing to lose money on this. Uh, they haven't yet lost nearly as much as the U.S. does. The U.S. habitually loses $15 trillion for countries in the middle of nowhere. But anyway, the Chinese are apparently willing to lose money on this. And so, you know, I presume they're hoping to either scare the U.S. or intimidate the U.S. Uh, or perhaps they actually dream of managing to, you know, cut by cut, bring the U.S. dollar down. Of course, to achieve that, they're going to need a lot of cooperation from the U.S. itself, especially from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has been pretty bad recently. You know, it's been essentially, actually, it's been substantially worse than the 1970s. Uh, if you look at the amount of money that was printed in the U.S. or the increase in the money supply in the U.S. Uh, since the beginning of COVID, it's it's been running at about twice the pace that it was in the 1970s. So the Fed has been sort of historically irresponsible. But of course, then it comes down to, you know, you can't beat something with nothing. And Europe has been uh, even worse. Japan, it, I'm not sure if it's been worse. It's been on a par. The only reason why Japan does not look so bad is because it sort of had this legacy of um, it, it was creating money, but that was not being released out into the economy. Uh, so at this point, there's really you know no other currency that is much better than the U.S. And again, this is similar to the 1970s, right? So when the U.S. inflated in the 70s, because these other countries piggybacked on that, it was not just a U.S. problem, right? If the whole rest of the world had been on a gold standard and just Nixon had come along and done his business, then, yeah, that might have been the death of the dollar. But as it is, of course, all of these other currencies, I mean, there is no gold-backed currency. There is really nothing to go to that doesn't have the enormous transaction costs of either you know, physical bullion gold and, you know, especially Bitcoin, which, you know, their transaction costs, uh, their liquidity problems, given the size of the Bitcoin market, uh, their cognitive problems that are, you know, sort of slowing down the adoption so that Bitcoin's market capitalization doesn't get to the point where it can displace uh, bonds. And all of those are going to take time, you know, so I think the most likely is sort of this combination of, you know, we've got gold early on. Gold kind of does what it's always done, act as backup plan with recognition that those transaction costs are still going to be enormous. You know, the difference in what it costs you to buy and sell a dollar and what it costs you to buy and sell uh, gold, especially at scale. And then, you know, sort of coming in after that, sort of converting people one by one uh, would be Bitcoin, which I think is on a fundamental level, obviously superior to gold. Uh, the main trick is just it takes time. It's it's almost the, I think it was Max Planck, uh, Science Advances, uh, Funeral by Funeral. And, you know, older, pe maybe that's a bit macabre, but older people do have trouble <laughs> comprehending Bitcoin. The amount of awareness, how Bitcoin works, uh, understanding how to use it, uh, how it's structured, what the, you know, cost benefit, what the risk, all of these are much, much higher among young people. Uh, and so that that entire process, I think, is still going to take uh, quite some time, minimum 20, 30 years. Uh, and so, you know, that figures in then if we're talking about sort of the end game on fiat, which is not likely in the near future. But if we sort of game that out, then, of course, the critical question becomes, when are we talking? Right. It, it's it's like citing a science fiction story. Right. Are you putting it in 2040? You're putting it in, you know, uh, 2090. All right. And that's going to change your technology. And in this case. Right. Whether the successor, in other words, whether the one to beat for fiat is going to be gold uh, or Bitcoin, I think is going to have a lot to do with the time frame. In a sense, I think Bitcoin is going to be a much more formidable competitor because Bitcoin can fundamentally do everything fiat can do better. But you know, because of that awareness and sort of market penetration, that's it's only going. It, it sort of needs time to grow up. It's still a little bit too young to um, to be the best contender against fiat. Yeah, I guess this this uh, this sums up my uh, view quite nicely, which is that the way that I see it is the, there's no hope for any of the other fiats to replace the dollar, and yeah. as you know, there's, there's no de-dollarization in order to go and uh, move on to another fiat currency. I, I just don't see that happening. So we were talking about I, I was mentioning the saleability. You know, there's the liquidity, which is a big part of the saleability. But there's also just thinking of the saleability of the ability to move money around. With the dollar, you've already got a 60 year old network of banks and central banks around the world that allow you to move dollars around. 
nothing comes close and you can't just build something like this overnight it's so the chinese or the indians or the russians can't just introduce an alternative and say hey you know here's here's a big giant network that you could all join and we can all uh, use it i mean these things take time to build and <laughs> the security and that's it's, it's not something that can be easily implemented but then also if you think about the sustainability across time in terms of monetary policy, you know, the, do the dollar is, you know, we all like to joke about the dollar and about the printing and about, uh, you know, money printer go burr and uh, jokes about Powell and all those things. Very true. The, obviously, the dollar is nowhere near a hard money, but it is the hardest of the fiats. It's still the least inflationary of all the fiat currencies out there. I mean, in, in the fiat standard, they looked at the supply growth rate for the last 60 years for national currencies. And it was really the US dollar and Switzerland and Sweden and Denmark that were the top four. And Switzerland is in there because initially it had very low growth in its early years relatively when it was on the gold standard. Now it's it's falling behind. So even though they print a lot of money, the thing is because the U.S. dollar is just so enormous, even when they print a lot, it's 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 a drop in the bucket of the total right. U.S. dollar supply. Exactly. Whereas you know uh, by relative volume, the Lebanese central bank, for instance, can print tiny amounts of money to pay off of tiny little uh, corrupt public sector uh, <laughs> with a few thousand, few tens of thousands, of, well, no, few hundreds of thousands of employees. Yeah. And then the whole thing comes falling apart because right. you have a very small base of liquidity. So if you increase it to it, uh, if you want to get any kind of uh, meaningful amount of seniorage, you know, theft, as it's more commonly known, by printing money, you're going to need to really print a large amount of money compared to the existing stockpile. So that devalues it more. And in a sense, um, I think that for Americans specifically, I think that's created uh, an enormous danger in the sense that because we could get away with that for so long, you know, if you tally up the uh, amount of dollars in existence that are outside of the US, uh, you're probably talking about two or three times more dollars in existence that are actually needed in the U.S. itself, you know, comparing it uh, to a standard country where most of its currency is used domestically. And so this, you know, if the U.S. were to lose that reserve currency status, if it were to do something uh, catastrophic, you know, in terms of either managing the money supply, which of course would do its own uh, devaluation, or, you know, in terms of uh, harassing other countries, if it were to do something catastrophic and that money were actually to come in, or alternatively, if you know, China or some other country did come up with some kind of a commodity-backed currency. Anyway, if we got to the point where people stop using dollars, the amount of dollars that would come flooding back into the United States would be epic. I mean, it would, it, you know, it would be two to three times um, the current amount of dollars. The U.S. government certainly does not know how many dollars in existence. And of course, you know, there's there's M1, two, or there's M1, there's M2, there's, you know, it's been fractionally reserved to different degrees or rehypothecated overseas. They take rough estimates, you know, they have sort of proxies that they guess. But I, I don't know, you've got maybe several hundred billion dollars in drug cartels. You've got, I mean, there's a lot of dollars overseas that is not necessarily written down anywhere. And if that comes back, then I think it'd be catastrophic for the American people who are, you know, notably the only people in the world who are actually obligated by law to use the US dollar are Americans. So if all those dollars come rushing back, if no foreigners want them, then Americans would be quite surprised that, you know, reserve currency has been a trap. Uh, and by the way, a trap that the American people did not benefit from, right? Because all of those dollars, one of the metaphors I like is that you've got kind of this um, reservoir of dollars in existence. And, you know, the Fed and the commercial banks are sort of printing new dollars. They're pouring water into that reservoir. So normally that would create inflation because, because the reservoir uh, level comes up. However, if you've got a bunch of foreigners who want to buy your currency, then that's akin to draining out of that reservoir. Okay. And so if a lot of foreigners want your dollars, then you can also print a whole lot of dollars. And you're not going to affect the levels of the reservoir. In other words, the voters aren't going to get angry because even though you've got a flood coming in, you've also got a flood coming out. 
And that has been going on for, what, 70, 80 years now. You've had these giant floods coming in from the Fed, from the American commercial banks. They've been flooding the reservoir with apparently two to three times more dollars. And those have dutifully flooded out to foreigners who uh, give us useful things for them. So, of course, if you get to a point now you know, it, it, it's a bit like climbing up a cliff halfway, right? So <laughs> without equipment, like maybe you shouldn't have done it, right? Unless you were perfectly confident that you could always maintain that reserve currency status, don't do it, right? Because if that does reverse, all of that comes flooding back at once. This is part of the reason why I worry about China going the gold route uh, is that that would so cleanly knock America out of the game without firing a shot, right? If you could put out a gold-backed currency, of course, China has a dual currency system. So they, they have the somewhat unique ability to shelter their domestic market from a gold-backed currency. Uh, if they came up with something like that, that I think would actually stand a chance of knocking the dollar out. If that were to happen, all of that capital flooding back, <laughs> the, the, there would be a lot of um, political disruption in the United States such that China could basically do whatever it wants for probably a couple of years there, uh, possibly longer. Yeah, I mean, th th that's obviously true. But I think if I were to make the counterpoint to that, I'd just say that it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you use the term uh, the cleanest dirty shirt or the fastest the horse in the glue factory or all there those things. But uh, I, th I think there's a lot of truth to that in that the way that it is right now, there's an enormous amount of currencies out there that are likely to collapse before the US dollar. Right. And every single one of those collapsing mm -hmm. leads to an increase in the demand for the US dollar. Because essentially, when you think of Lebanon, the example of Lebanon, Lebanon went from being a country where the central bank held the dollars and then people held the, what I call the dollar plus the country risk, which is the dollar plus the risk of the central bank defaulting. And so because of that, uh, because people didn't hold much dollars directly, that allowed the central bank and the government a certain margin of essentially uh, basically ripping their people off. They're effectively the dollar dealers. You know what they do is they're providing a stable coin to the dollar, and they're living off the idea. They're living off ripping off their people uh, by um, printing more of that currency. Well, when that collapses, people yeah, people obviously lose a lot of money. But then, moving forward, everybody starts stacking U.S. dollars. And so that probably increases demand for the U.S. dollar in the long run because now everybody in Lebanon is saving in U.S. dollars directly rather than in, you know, adulterated dollars, which were maybe 40 percent U.S. dollar and 60 percent Lebanese government goodness added in. <laughs> now they're just uh, buying physical cash. And so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that than the situation of people dumping the dollar because realistically, yeah, uh, or I, I, actually here's how I put it. The Lebanese, Brazilian, Chinese person can get onto the US dollar much easier than their central bank can because you can use physical cash and now you can use stable coins, which I think are going to be another massive dollar bill driver. Because now, you know, in Russia, you can buy dollars effectively by buying a stable coin. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, the, and, and what, does the, what does the stable coin back, or at least Tether, we know, I'm not so sure about the other ones that pay interest and do all kinds of weird things. But with Tether, a lot of the, what they do is they take the money that people use to buy their coins when they issue them, and they buy treasuries with it. So they're really upping the demand for it. In fact, if you look at the numbers, Tether is one of the top 20 central banks in terms of its purchases of U.S. treasuries. I think there is, and I, and I said this in the, in the podcast we had with uh, Paolo Arduino, who's the uh, CTO of Tether. Uh, you can see how Tether could 10x. You can't really see how any, any of these other central banks can 10x. So I think there's a huge potential for people to start buying more and more dollars because with dollars, with physical dollars, not just cash, but also with Tether, any individual now has access to using dollars and can have excellent saleability because you can sell them all over the world, whereas central banks don't have an easy way of dealing with it, so right. uh, of, of moving away from the dollar. 
Yeah, I think uh, stable coins are really interesting in this whole game, right? So they are overwhelmingly dominated by the U.S. dollar. I think the U.S. dollar is something like 99.5% uh, of stable coin demand. And, you know, in other words... I think that's very telling, you know? Nobody wants any of the correct. other stable coins. And, of course, you can start a stable coin in any currency you want. Uh, I think that there are euro coins. There's a Japanese coin, which I think has a market cap. Or, last time I checked, it was about $100,000. You've got, you know, Chinese coins. No, nobody wants any of this stuff, right? It's all the U.S. dollar. And what, to me, is fun is to the extent that the stable coin custodian, you know, has actually backed it, as they promised, um, USD coin is uh, very good about that. They've been, you know, trying hard to play ball, you know, to sort of paint inside the lines. But at any rate, assuming that it does have sufficient backing, I think stable coins are fascinating because they have the potential to fundamentally replace fractional reserve banking uh, with something that you know is actually uh, what people think their bank account is, right? That you know you you have sort of a token that directly represents. Uh, the underlying assets that is supposed to have one-to-one uh, correspondence. So I'm I'm optimistic about stable coins. Uh, I think banks are also aware of this potential, so uh, they've been fighting very hard to go after stable coins. Of course, there's a model of stable coin that is extremely dangerous, uh, scammy really, uh, which is the algorithmic central bank model. You know, the coin doesn't necessarily hold maybe any assets at all. It just sort of intervenes in the market and buys and sells. That, of course, duplicates the central bank. And so we know that that's scammy. Uh, and indeed, a number of them have failed. <laughs> But, you know, sort of accepting the, the or uh, setting aside the sort of scammier uh, stable coins and central banks, I think that fully backed stable coin model, I think that that's quite interesting for sort of backdooring us into a full reserve banking system. I think so. Yeah, I, th I think there is, there's a case to be made for that, very much so. I think, you know, the, this is the other thing that we want to talk to you about on fractional reserve banking, which we'll get to it in a minute. But I want to keep whipping the de-dollarization horse. I think so... The, the the real issue, as as I was saying earlier, is that there's no alternative for the central banks to get into, right. and then of course the the only uh, possible alternative would be gold, because gold, you know, it's about ten trillion dollar market, so it does have the kind of size that you could uh, get in and out of considerably. Right. But of course, the settlement and clearance of gold is extremely costly and inefficient, and it's something that it was going to require actual you know, physical and market infrastructure. You know, you, you need to build um, all these extremely sophisticated mechanisms for moving gold around uh, safely right. and for testing it. I think this is one of the most uh, important ones. So you can move gold around. It's a lot more expensive than moving Bitcoin around currently. But what's even much more expensive than moving it is verifying it. The only way that you can know for sure that a gold bar is truly a legitimate gold bar that you receive in payment, if you want to take it and knowing that you have no recourse to go back to the person who paid, who gave it to you and tell them, hey, your gold bar is broken. The only way that you can verify that, you know, the only way that you can do it trustlessly without having to rely on the other person is to melt down the entire gold bar and recast it again. And that's pretty expensive. So, it's you know it's 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 not feasible for in my opinion to do it in a year or two for all these governments to figure out a way where they're going to implement their own gold verification system and then start trading with it and of course you can't just have one central gold verification system we already have the LBMA and you know you can't just take your uh, you, you never really know how uh, their system works. Their gold. If you want to verify your gold, co your gold bar, you take it out. You have to take it out and pull it out of the system. So you can't. You, you don't really know if the gold bar is still there. You don't know if it's actually right. a real gold bar. And and I don't. Right. And you know the LBMA is what gave us modern central banks. So I think if you were going to be doing something between in a in a multipolar world, you're going to need to have you know all these governments all over the world build the infrastructure for trading gold. I don't see that happening because it's just extremely expensive and time consuming. And it's not something that the world has even uh, begun to consider doing seriously. Yeah. And that's why, you know, many times through history, fiat has been tried. And generally, once you go fiat, you don't gradually shift over to gold. 
right? You you sort of need to fall off a cliff. Something really bad has to happen in order to go back to gold. And, you know, indeed, that's the reason, right? Once the liquidity concentrates in the fiat, no matter how bad the fiat is, you, you know, to shift over to gold in each of those periods, if you sort of take a snapshot, you know, if you're looking at the... Um, the Song Dynasty China or something, gold is going to look similar. It's going to have similar downsides to what it has today, right? So it's going to have lousy local liquidity, right? So, you know, parking your money in gold or at that time, silver would have been more likely. Uh, that is going to impose enormous costs. Gold, of course, ironically, given why people love gold, uh, gold has a number of fundamental flaws that are all to do with its physical nature. Uh, it is very hard to move. You have to pay people to custodian it. The fact that you have to pay them means that typically uh, custodianship is centralized. Governments know how to find centralized things. Uh, and so it's inevitably controlled by government. Uh, and then, of course, you have the assay problems. And, you know, in the sort of limit, you would have to melt down a, uh, I guess, some gold dust every time you pay your monthly uh, Netflix bill. You'd have to, I suppose you'd have to hand carry it down and hire men to protect you depending on uh, how much how much gold you're involved because it's a bare asset. You know, gold has a number of fundamental flaws that mean that uh, in a sense, once fiat takes over, it stays took over until something bad enough happens that you know people flee to gold sort of by necessity, at which point the gold market then pumps up. Now it is a liquid market all of a sudden. It wasn't yesterday, but it is today. And then at that point, you know, the 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 sort of game theory locks into gold at that point. And so, you know, if we take the gold world market today, for example, it's about a 10 trillion market that does not compete with US Treasuries. It's not that bad, but at any rate, it is less liquid than uh, US Treasuries. But on the other hand, if the world starts moving there because fiat screw the pooch once again, then that liquidity goes up, right? And so there there will come a time in that process where gold will be the most liquid. Uh, and then at least on the liquidity grounds, gold would then be fiat. And then that would bring us to the next question, right? Which is given gold's fundamental flaws, you know, when when you talk about how wonderful gold has been as a currency historically, people might reasonably ask, well, why does nobody use gold, right? Why has gold failed the market test and everybody's using fiat? And you know, I think the answer to that is that violence pays. Gold is physically vulnerable. Governments, you know, it's always been a risk, especially, you know, once you have a complicated economy that is depending on intermediaries to, you know, move value across distance, you necessarily you have people involved who have street addresses, and government is very good at finding street addresses and imposing their will on them. You know, I think in a combination uh, of those really. You know, the only way that gold comes in would be an absolute disaster. At that point, depending when we're talking about, I think the Bitcoin solution to some of those physical problems comes in. Yeah, um, I just want to quibble a little bit uh, on your issue. You said you know gold isn't quite as big as treasuries because your treasuries are about twenty-five trillion. Gold is about ten trillion. Yeah, but I think the key point here is that treasuries are not one fungible asset. There are all kinds of different treasuries yep. at different durations and different uh, issue dates. And so these individual treasuries are not as big as gold. And that's, that's I think, a key point in the favor of gold. Why gold, in my opinion, is infinitely better money than treasuries because one ounce of gold equals to one ounce of gold. Although, you know, there's tungsten in a lot of these ounces these days, but uh, theoretically, at least we could verify it definitely beats the U.S. Treasuries in the, in the, in that regard. Yeah, and 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 you're right. There are a lot of transactions in Treasuries where they're looking for a specific duration for whatever reason, right? That they they have like a target uh, interest rate or a target volatility, uh, and so right. Indeed, for for a lot of that market, uh, gold is actually more liquid today. And then you know it's a separate question of the custodian, the sort of underdeveloped uh, transmission markets, the higher transaction costs, which. I think are improving over time, but then of course, you know, fiat also lowers its transaction costs, things like FedNow or CBDCs, which for all of their horrors visited upon the liberties and prosperity of their people, they have low transaction costs. Yeah. But I think the biggest impediment toward uh, an adoption of a gold standard is that, you know, these governments, they might hate the dollar. But they hate the dollar less than they hate <laughs> fiscal and monetary discipline. And so if right. they wanted to trade amongst themselves with gold, 
there's no way around it. They're going to have to peg their currencies to gold, and then they're going to have to go on a gold standard, and that's just going to clip their wings. And I mean, obviously, it's going to be great for their economies, great for their people. So obviously, they're not going to do it because that's not what governments are there for. They're not. Yeah. Uh, they're not there to serve the people. The people are there to serve the government. <laughs> so, uh, so you can't see them. Like, you know, they, they keep making all these noises, but like, there aren't many gold bug Austrian economists in any central bank anywhere in the world. No matter how much they talk about how much they don't like the dollar. You know, the Keynesians are in charge in China or in Russia or in uh, India or in Brazil or in South Africa. They want to print money to buy elections and raise aggregate demand and engage in all kinds of stupid Keynesian voodoo. You can't do all of that nonsense if you're on a gold standard. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this is why historically uh, really gold hard money tends to come back in when, um, you know, you really got to screw up uh, before it comes back in. Keynesians are always or inflationists, the, you know, longstanding name. They're always the most popular kid at the party because they're showing up and they're they're giving every a, a budget increase for you. We got more money for the army. We got more money for the statisticians. You know, you win a prize, you win a prize. Um, they're always going to be the most popular. You know, this is also part of the reason that, you know, one might root for like bond vigilantes and other sort of external mechanisms that control fiscal irresponsibility because politicians, you know, voters also like having a party all the time. If you're the guy who shows up and says, now, now, we have to live within our means, we have to think about tomorrow, uh, and the other guy is offering yet another party, it, it's, it's tough to beat that. Exactly. And that's why I think... I mean, this this is really, I think, the impediment towards moving to a gold standard. And then if you don't have a gold standard, if you don't have an international gold-based monetary order, it's complete fiction to imagine that you could just build an alternative to the dollar because you're asking for the only way that that can be done is that all the other central banks of the world need to pick one of those central banks to make them basically the final boss instead of the U.S. dollar. So it doesn't solve anything for anybody. It's just saying, hey, I mean, the, the the best case scenario is China goes to all those countries and says, hey, you don't enjoy the dollar. How about you use the yuan instead and then let us have all the privilege that the U.S. has? And that's not that's not an attractive proposition. I think many, many people and politicians make the idea, which I think is unwork, completely unworkable, this idea that we can use a basket of our own currencies or we can use a basket of commodities right. as the global reserve currency. You can't do that. There has to be one currency. There has to be one thing because if you're mixing in all a bunch of, thi- a bunch of things together, all that you're doing is that just the, the monetary policy is about who decides what goes into that basket. And then it's the same thing. So there's always going to be a person in charge of this, effectively. Yeah. And, you know, China, I think the sort of most realistic scenario for that would be that China would have to make it in everybody's interest. They would have to pay significant sums of money. Uh, It may not approach the, you know, whatever trillion plus uh, that the U.S. wastes on its empire, but it would certainly have to waste a lot of money on its own emerging empire in order to get there because on its own, right, countries, it wouldn't be in their interest. and. I think they would have to surmount the transaction costs inherent in that sort of buy currency system, which we we have had in periods in history. We've had uh, gold and silver coexist, uh, but it's unstable. Normally, it's going one way or the other. If China was trying to buy their way into it uh, and sort of you know get the ball rolling and try to get critical mass on that, I think it would be grotesquely expensive. The cost of it would depend on how much cooperation they get from the U.S., uh, specifically how irresponsible Fed policy is, you know, possibly if the U.S. is, is shooting itself uh, in the foot in other ways with sanctions or sanctions-like activities. So if they got a lot of help from the U.S., if the U.S. were irresponsible and as stupid as it's been, then, you know, it'd be expensive. But I think that's doable for China without having to go to the gold backing route or, or you know, something out of the game like that. On the other hand, you know, it, it, it would be extremely expensive uh, for China. And if the U.S. is you know, maintains any modicum of responsibility, then it would take a very long time uh, and a high cost for China. Assuming it's China. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming it's China. I think ultimately, you know, uh, at this point, the percentage of global reserves in the Chinese yuan is um, basically round down to zero. Yeah. It's like two or three or something like that. Exactly. It's basically nothing. 
And uh, I think there's a very good reason for that. And the main reason is that China doesn't have an open capital account. You can't just move money in and out of China. So not only do they not have the same level of liquidity that the Treasury has, they are not even trying. They're not even in that race. They are making it illegal for you to even try and pump the size of their cash balances. It's You can't buy in and out of Chinese capital markets easily. And so that is a complete non-starter. That's why, you know, the, the Saudis issue press releases instead of just dumping their treasuries and buying Chinese bonds. And that would be the, you know, the, you know, the line from the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you're going to shoot, shoot, don't talk. That's why all these central banks are talking. They talk about getting rid of the dollar. But really, if you actually wanted to get rid of the dollar, you wouldn't talk about it. You would you would go out and say, we are committed to a lifelong relationship with the U.S. dollar because we believe it is the strongest, most important, best currency that the world has ever known. And you would dump your dollars <laughs> and treasuries while you're yeah, doing exactly. that. You know, right. you, you'd want to drum up the value of those things, talk them up, and then dump your treasuries and buy Chinese bonds. But these bonds don't exist. Uh, or, I mean, they do exist, but I mean, the possibility of buying them as a, as a monetary asset doesn't exist as long as China has closed capital accounts. So that's that's really the tricky part. I, I tweeted this the other day. There's that quote by Ronnie Coleman, uh, eight-time, I think, Olympia champion, the, the, one of the best bodybuilders in history. And he says, everybody wants to be a bodybuilder, but nobody wants to lift heavy-ass weights. Everybody wants to get rid of the U.S. dollar, but nobody wants to have a global reserve currency that in t because that entails, you know, no, nobody wants to open their capital account. Nobody wants to have responsible monetary policy. And that's that's what it comes down to, in my opinion. Yeah. And so, you know, you could imagine China, for example, more or less putting out a currency that they don't necessarily use. Right. I think usually when we talk about new fiats, you know, we sort of implicitly assume that the country is going to be uh, using it at home. But right, China has this kind of almost dual currency. It's got the the external yuan and the internal yuan. And so in a sense, it would be, I don't know, almost like how the euro is used in some parts of the world. You know, it, it's just sort of this this imaginary sort of outside currency. And, you know, that scenario I could see China doing, then it avoids the sort of uh, at-home costs of actually having a hard currency. But again, that's something that would be tremendously expensive, I think, for them to maintain. And they would need an enormous amount of cooperation from the U.S. to actually continue shooting themselves in the foot. How how would that work? Like, how would you maintain two different currencies, two different exchange rates? Yeah, they do it uh, today. So, so my understanding is that uh, you've got the yuan overseas, and then those those sort of circulate overseas, and then you have to go to the central bank for permission to bring them back into the country. So I know there's separation. The maximum divergence in exchange rates, I think, has never been more than five or ten percent. But I don't know that that's been market tested. So, yeah, I don't I don't know the dynamics enough exactly how they're kept separate. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Ultimately, money wants to be one, and so <laughs> wanting to use as a global reserve currency currency that's not actually a currency and is pegged with all kinds of weird arrangements. I mean, it's you could open your capital markets and have a better inflationary monetary policy, I guess. And that's a very hard way of doing it. Or I guess let's put it this way. De-dollarization can happen at three levels. There's press releases, which everybody's always doing. You know, just the other day, Kenya and the Emirates announced that they're not going to use the dollar as if, you know, they're going to be holding each other's currencies. So there's the press release de-dollarization, which everybody does every two weeks. Then there's the you know win on the economic battlefield, which is open up your capital markets, make a better dollar, and offer the world's banks, everybody on the world's banks and central banks, the ability to use your currency and just outcompete the dollar on the uh, marketplace. And then there, and that's the sort of intermediate level of de-dollarization. And then there's the advanced level of de-dollarization, and that entails winning a world war against the U.S. That's <laughs> <laughs> That's the most difficult one. So I guess you know the, the, this is this would be my explanation for why we keep hearing about de-dollarization. We keep hearing about it because the first option, the <laughs> the press release de-dollarization, is a lot easier than the actual real world de-dollarization options. Oh yeah, absolutely right. And you know the best press releases are going to lead to is, I mean, in practice, you know, China subsidizing usage. And then, you know, again, that drips off a little bit here, a little bit there. 
at best it's death by a thousand cuts. But you know the sort of intermediate scenario where Chinese, let's say Chinese currency actually outcompetes, you know, accepting them gold backing it, which would then require them to either have a, you know, hard monetary policy, which is probably not interested in, or in having some mechanism to actually wall them off more than a five to 10 point spread. You know, it, it's, it's difficult beyond that sort of out of the game improvement in the Chinese currency to imagine uh, competing currency to currency uh, again, unless, I mean, you know, the U.S. would have to have policy that is substantially worse even than it is today. Yeah, which is why, in my mind, I think it's just I don't see de-dollarization happening with any other fiat currencies, but I do see it happening with Bitcoin. Because ultimately, the scoreboard, if you want to beat the dollar, if you want to replace the dollar, there's one scoreboard. There's one metric that you need to win, and that's the size of cash balances. So currently, the treasuries and the U.S. dollars globally are about $30, $32 trillion. That's the bar. You know, That's the total amount of dollars that are held by the world and the total amount of treasury bonds. That's what makes dollars the most liquid thing. None of the others are even – none of the national central banks are even fighting in – are even playing that race because playing that race requires you to – have open capital markets, non-inflationary monetary policy, and all of that stuff. So they're not even trying to increase their cash balances beyond the dollar. But I know someone who is, and it goes <laughs> by the name of Bitcoin. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's still at a very low level. It's only a few. It's only what six hundred billion dollars right now. So it's at a. It's higher uh, recently, but yes, yes, yeah. We've been having a great week here uh, as we're recording, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's still, what, uh, one fifteenth or something of gold at the moment, yeah. Exactly. Yep. So it's it's one fiftieth of the total U.S. dollar uh, right. treasuries uh, complex. So, yeah, it's only 3%, but, you know, it's <laughs> Bitcoin is built on the number go up technology, and yeah. it is going up, and it doesn't have a central bank that is going to uh, kneecap it while it's going up. So... If it keeps going up, it becomes the biggest cash balances. Eventually, it has to. I mean, if it just keeps going up and the dollar keeps going down in terms of real value, it's not going to be this year. It might Maybe five years, maybe 20, maybe 50, maybe 100. But I think my personal opinion is that this is kind of a, an unmistakable trend. And that's yeah. how we're going to get de-dollarization. I don't see gold doing it. I don't see any of these other things doing it. I think it's – I think – my, my, the way that I'd look at it is that the threat to the dollar from other fiat currencies is like the threat to Bitcoin from other digital currencies. There, There is no second best. And it's really just the world, it's just going to be a, some time for the world to figure out the fact that there are there is no second best fiat and there is no second best crypto. And then those two are going to go head to head. <laughs> I, uh, so I don't think the difference is that big, in my opinion, um, between, say, the dollar and the euro. You know, there is a conceivable point where the U.S. Uh, prints so much money or has such irresponsible uh, money supply that, that I think, let's just say the euro, uh, to take something more realistic, uh, could take over from it. This would be completely different from Bitcoin, where I think the, the shit coins have no hope. They're, uh, they're just, I mean, forget about it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the yeah. Europeans don't have military bases in the U.S. The U.S. has military bases in Europe. I think it that does, but uh, that, that complicates uh, things. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be curious. I don't know enough about, let's say, uh, late Roman history. You know, so I, I would guess that there were competing fiats, and that to very, you know, this is in the uh, Diocletian stage when they were, you know, sort of going. They were printing a lot, and I mean, I'd be curious um, to know how the the market share shifted. But I, I guess I'm just saying that sort of from a from a fundamental architectural perspective, the euro and the dollar work pretty much the same. Yes, I think the U.S. gets a bonus for this sort of security for you know dollarization bargain at polls. Uh, I think that's a relatively small part of the overseas dollar market. I guess five percent or something around there. Uh, and so it's certainly possible, you know, if the Fed is is sufficiently irresponsible, then I think it can overwhelm that. Even though you know, Germany and Britain don't have uh, cool bases. But, you know, whereas with, with Bitcoin, uh, I do think it's more structural. But, you know, at the top, we were talking about the sort of chapters versus end of the book. And, 
you know, I think we absolutely agree that uh, we know how the book ends. And, you know, the book ends with uh, fiat dying and Bitcoin taking over as the currency. Uh, each chapter, I think, is going to depend on how long that takes. I think we also agree that that's not something that's going to happen, you know, in the next five years or something. Uh, and so, you know, is it going to, is fiat going to live long enough that by the time it dies, a sufficiently large number of people understand and use Bitcoin that, you know, Bitcoin can then um, sort of happily absorb that liquidity and and actually be, right, because at at that moment, I think gold will kind of be the competition. And so does that evaporating fiat liquidity, you know, does it morph or does it, uh, I mean, it doesn't quite move, but, you know, uh, does it end up uh, in gold or does it end up in Bitcoin? You know, if the process we're talking about is relatively early, I think most likely it ends up getting in gold. And then you have sort of this gradual shift from gold to Bitcoin simply because Bitcoin is better gold. If, on the other hand, fiat's going to live a long time, then I think it's much more likely that we skip the gold phase altogether because by 2050 or 2070, um, enough people know Bitcoin that you know it, it just uh, scooches right over and the buying power then ports into Bitcoin. And then all of a sudden, Bitcoin is by far the most liquid asset. And you'd be completely bonkers to try to use, of course, fiat, but you'd also at that point be bonkers to try to use gold. Yeah. I'll also add one small thing, which is that part of what the European Central Bank holds are US dollar reserves. Right. So the euro, euro is to an extent backed by the dollar itself. And European countries, when they trade with the rest of the world, they use uh, extensively a lot of U.S. dollars. So the size of U.S. dollar reserves globally is about three times as large as the euro. It's about 20% euro and 60% dollar, and then 20% is everything else uh, right. combined. So, I mean, when the, if, if the dollar goes down, the euro goes down because a lot of the European reserves are backed by dollar. And also, I think more generally... It's it's a lot of it is just in a sense European governments are puppets of the U.S. to a very large extent, so I can't really see much of a uh, uh, going against them. Right, they're they're not going to you know um, straight go against them. Of course, um, they benefit so much from American. I don't know whether to call it generosity or bullying, but anyway, it's a combination <laughs> the the bad boyfriend relationship that they have with the U.S. So right, they're they're certainly not going to go against them. But on the other hand, you know, I think all of the sort of traditional central banks in the world operate like uh, algorithmic stable coins. They more or less have a number of tokens that float around. And if if demand for the tokens changes too much, then uh, they ingest in some way or the other. Of course, all in the background of trying to inflate as much as possible to serve their masters. In that scenario, even if the dollars they're holding are losing value, you know, if the number of tokens floating around in Europe are relatively constant, then you know, I don't know that for starters, Europeans would like stop using euros, right? You know, we talked in the beginning about this kind of inertia built into fiat. If if we sort of imagine that the dollar hyperinflated, and so now all of the dollars held in in, in the ECB uh, have zero value, I don't think anybody day to day in like the streets of Paris are going to stop accepting euros, right? They're just going to regard them as the same euros they ever were. They're probably not even aware that there's any backing per se. So, you know, at that point, sort of the model, I think the analytical model is that algorithmic central bank model. So if the number of tokens are relatively stable, I don't think anybody much cares. Uh, certainly day to day users um, don't care. And, you know, even large sophisticated users, from their perspective, the only thing they care about the ECB is tokens go up like you know how how many tokens are going to be in the future is there going to be enough demand to soak up all those tokens at you know a given buying power or is that buying power going to change um i'm not sure that they much care uh what's backing them yeah i yeah perhaps but i mean it's still a stretch to see europe take on a kind of uh, global leadership role at the expense of the u.s for sure for sure right yeah that's what it yeah, uh, yeah. I think Europe is extremely comfortable. Uh, they love the way things have been for a long time now. The, the The U.S. takes all the hits. You know, the U.S. runs around and picks fights with China or Syria. Or I mean, it's it's obscene. Now, you know, of course, a lot of those backfire and they cause a lot more trouble. And then every so often, the Europeans come back and say, "Hey, tone it back a little." But I mean, 
you know, I think it'd be glorious if the Europeans stopped using the Americans as, you know, somewhat unruly mercenaries, you know, who every so often they go out and fight the enemies, but then every so often they sort of over pillage and then they end up causing a backlash, you know, coming back to Europe. But, you know, fundamentally it, it is very much in the interest, I think, of European countries as well as other client countries like Japan, really across the world. Uh, it's not in the interest of the American people who suffer all of this, but of course, it's very much in the interest of the American elite, and so it, it, you know, it's it's got its game theory <laughs> equilibria, and uh, it's likely to continue. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I guess we all agree, Bitcoin is going to have to fix this. <laughs> Always, it's just a question of timeline, and. Uh, yeah, you know, people call me controversial and call uh-huh. me uh, all kinds of things. You but never, me, no, I, I, I've never heard that. Safe, I know. Ev- everybody on my podcast <laughs> agrees that Bitcoin fixes everything. I, I don't know where they get this from. <laughs> I've never heard that about you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard the opposite. Yep. Okay, well, the next thing we wanted to talk about is fractional yes. reserve banking. Fractional reserve. So yeah. the world's the world's uh, well, the U.S.'s banks seem to be in big trouble, and the world in general as well. Credit Suisse is no longer with us. Uh, Silicon Valley and a whole bunch of other uh, U.S. banks are in deep trouble, and uh, it's gotten a lot of people to uh, uh, bring up the old debate on fractional reserve banking versus full reserve banking. We both have pretty strong opinions on this. And surprise, surprise, we also happen to agree on this. (laughs) So what is your case against fractional reserve banking and why does it create problems? Uh, Let's see, it's fundamentally fraud. You know, boiling it down, the bank is accepting your dollar and telling you that it's sitting right there waiting for you anytime you want. It's right here for safekeeping. And it turns out they Xerox it. They, you know, put a little picture there for you and then they go out and lend it. Uh, and so they are effectively uh, duplicating dollars fraudulently. And I say fraudulently because the depositor does not know this. Lynn Alden, uh, she compared you know, banks to leveraged bond funds, or she, uh, they are essentially leveraged bond funds. And you know, if you sit down with your grandmother at Thanksgiving and you say, Grandma, why have you put your life savings in a leveraged bond fund that's you know, buying sovereign <laughs> debt in Argentina? And she'll say, what, are you crazy? <laughs> it's in the bank, just up the street. It's right there. Okay, the depositors it's not are not in Argentina. Uh, yeah, right. She's like, what are you talking about? Right. So the depositors are not aware how fractional reserve works. They think their money is actually there, safe and sound. You know, so that sort of goes to the free market argument that you know sometimes people say, no, no, no. You know, I don't want the government uh, telling you know banks how they can and can't do things. And it's not the question of controlling banks. It's a question of sort of common law interpretation of you know if a party to a contract does not understand it, then it is an invalid contract. If the other side knows they don't understand it and persists and try to pushing them into it, then that is, that is fraud. That has been fraud for a long time. Uh, if I go to an old folks home and you know, I ask them to visit the dementia ward and I try to sell everybody structured finance products, that is going to be considered fraud by any <laughs> reputable court. And similarly, I would argue that fractional reserve, given that people do not understand it, uh, we know they don't understand it because we have bank runs, but they're also, you know, in other words, when Walmart runs out of eggs, you don't like run home. Oh my God, cash in all of our gift cards. Walmart is done. You know, we got to get our money out before. Uh, no, you just say, well, maybe you'll have eggs tomorrow. The way fractional reserve actually works, right? If you show up and your money's not there, then what they should say, if they're telling the truth, they would say, well, we're out of money today, but we'll have more money tomorrow, which is accurate. But why don't people accept that? Why don't they say, oh, shoot, okay, maybe I'll come back early so I can get some of the, some of the new supply. No, they completely panic. They freak out. Why? Because they do not understand how it works. And then the next question is, how would you structure it, right? So, you know, that's sort of the standard opposition is, is, you know, this is crazy talk. These are crazy Austrians doing their thing again. And so I think it's, you know, useful to sort of sketch out what a full reserve bank system would look like. Uh, so today, about one out of five deposits are in checking accounts. The rest of them, the other 80% are in savings accounts. Uh, if we, it, that's actually been lower in the past, by the way, that went up because of ZERP. So there, there's very little uh, penalty to holding one over the other. Uh, traditionally, it was more like 10% uh, that was in checking accounts. Anyway, so if we imagine a full reserve system, then the way it would be structured is uh, any demand deposit, in other words, money payable in the moment, okay, that has to be cash backed, not by bonds, by cash. One for one dollar. No possibility of anything going wrong. If you say it's money, it better be money. So those are backed one for one. So 20% 
in demand deposits, those would be available anytime. Therefore, they have to be backed by cash. The other 80% would be in time deposits. So certificates of deposit, for example, some sort of effectively a contract where the money is lent for some period. It might be three months, might be a year, might be five years. Those, they don't have to be backed at all. Zero. All right. Why? Because, you know, corporations borrow money all the time. Ford Motors has many tens of uh, billions uh, in in bonds, and they don't have to back them because they have a predictable sequence when they're going to be due. Uh, on the other hand, Ford Motor Company, the money that it owes today, like the last paycheck that it owes somebody who just quit last week, that Ford Motor Company must have every last dollar on hand. If it does not, it is technically insolvent. Right. So the argument here would be treat banking the exact same way that we treat every other company, which is that if the company owes immediate debt, they have to have immediate assets, which are known as cash. If they have future debt, they don't have to hold anything. Nobody else has to do it. So if you had that system, right, you'd have something like 20% of consumer deposits would be in demand deposits. They'd have to be backed by cash. Uh, if we go by gold, the banks would charge some custody fees. So something like maybe a quarter point, 0.25% uh, uh, on that amount. And then meanwhile, customers could earn interest on the time deposits, right? Because the bank indeed is lending those out because it doesn't have to store them in reserve. Uh, and again, if we look at the real world, when you have those kinds of scenarios where the bank is charging for one part, you know, for example, uh, checking account fees, if they're charging for one part, but you have money in other things in the bank, they typically eat the fees. You know, so the most likely is that the bank will look at the custodial costs as a, you know, basically a marketing cost of acquiring new customers. They won't charge you anything. You know, by the way, one of the main sort of protests from the fractional reserve guys is that customers won't accept not getting interest on their bank deposits. In, in, in the US, bank deposit interests have been 0.1 to 0.2% for a number of years. People, they, they apparently accept it perfectly. It's, it's return free risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So, right, you know, whether it's on a sort of rights perspective, uh, you know, sort of a Rothbardian common law, you know, people have, uh, what kind of natural rights do customers have? Or whether it's an actual practical basis, uh, I think, you know, if we had a full reserve system, you would have no hit whatsoever to economic growth. You would still have loans, but you would not have the malinvestments going out. So the aggregate wealth, uh, especially over time, would be much, much higher. You would not have the economic cycles because, you know, you would be removing three quarters of the fluctuation in the monetary supply by eliminating the fractional reserve portion. And then, of course, you don't have bank panics, which every time there's a bank panic, we tend to get a big ratchet in government. Right? In 2008, something I used to use in, in, uh, in class was a chart of all regulations uh, during the, the 2000s. And you can see this, this is in the US. You can see this kind of gradual increase in all types of regulation. Uh, so this is environmental, labor, whatever, across the board. And all of a sudden, you get to 2008, and there's a huge jump in every single regulation. I mean, like 20 30% not two or three. And it's weird because offhand, you might say, well, what happened in 2008? It was a financial crisis. It was not a global warming crisis. Why did global warming regulations go up? And of course, the answer is this is how Leviathan works, right? Uh, when you have a crisis, it opens the Overton. We saw this with COVID. And everything sneaks in, right? You open the back door and every kind of critter gets in there. Uh, so I think that the aggregate sort of wealth dividend for humanity from getting rid of the fraud of fractional reserve banking is 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 incalculable is absolutely massive yeah i, I agree with you on on the identification of the issue i, I think however i my way of looking at it is a little bit different in that i don't think it's it's very useful to argue the fact that it is fraud or not while I agree it is because, you know, as you said, most people have no idea that they're out there financing Argentinian governments with, with a little bakery's uh, payroll money, basically. You also don't really know the things that go into your TV and you have no idea that you're, you know, the TV is requiring metals that were dug up in Kenya and Brazil or whatever. So just because, you know, you still agree to buy it. I think the real smoking gun in, in the case against it is the fact that you have no choice. There is no free market. It's not as if this was a market institution where 
Uh, we ended up, you know, there's a reason we use these metals to make TVs. It's because people buy the TVs that work with those metals. So you don't need to know that we need to get, say, Kenyan or Brazilian or whatever metals in order to make this TV work. But the companies that know how to make TV manage to use those, manage to only make those TV with those metals. If you try and do it with something else, it just doesn't work, doesn't turn out to be economical, and it doesn't survive. And so on the free market, we willingly choose this, and it works. And because... TVs are a free market, we don't <laughs> notice uh, an, an extremely big problem of TVs spontaneously blowing up and killing viewers. Because, you know, if anybody had a TV that uh, company that uh, made TVs that blew up, then they'd lose on the market. The problem in banking is that you have all of these banks constantly <laughs> blowing up right. and you have no alternative, right? There's no alternative for you. You have to lend to the Argentinian government. <laughs> yeah, There's well, no uh, way out of right. it. Yeah, you've got two problems. Uh, number one, you have no alternative. Uh, Caitlin Long, you know, of course, tried to start a bank and was uh, a, a full reserve bank um, and was denied. The other problem is that when the TV blows up, they get paid, right? So you know, you have sort of exactly. this natural incentive in the private market. You to have to make new TV from that. Yeah, exactly. Right, and you know, the company has liability exposure. And in you know, in the case of Fiat, you know, if we look at the two thousand eight crisis. And, you know, people say, why did Wall Street screw up? And you say, my God, they didn't screw up. Oh, they, they played the world like an absolute fiddle. They got paid Absolutely. all the way, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in profit pouring down on Wall Street. And then when it all came time, you know, when the casino came and uh, presented them a tally of their what they'd lost, they said, oh, here, guys, take care of this, would you? I mean, <laughs> Boy, I, I, I can see why they keep doing it. Yeah, they get paid. Exactly. It's a very lucrative mistake to make. I mean, this <laughs> it is, sure is. This is, the, this is I, I call it the department of very lucrative mistakes in fiat. Yes. It's, it's a very common thing because when you don't have uh, the accountability and when you have a money printer, it pays to mess things up because you always get bailed out. And so yeah. the reason that fractional reserve banking has one is not because it won on the market. It's not like the choice of TVs. It's one because it's a monopoly and it and it manages to externalize its costs onto its victims. So either the either the you know the bankers are going to make out fine. Even if the bank goes down, it's the depositors that are and the share. Well, the depositors and maybe the shareholders, but you know the management is going to be all right, likely. And if it is going to be the shareholders, it's going to be the small shareholders. It's not going to be the Big banks, their shareholders, you know, they are going to be all right. They're going to manage, come out of this unscathed every time. And the key thing, as you mentioned, is there is no alternative. There's no way of setting up a bank that is just boring. And this is, this is, I think, the, the thing that the fractional reserve banking fans cannot uh, answer. So they'll tell you, no, you're looking to ban things. What kind of free market person wants to ban consenting adults? Well, people want to put their money in a deposit account that's going to lend it out. They like to do that. It's worked for hundreds of years. People prefer to do it. And of course, the really, really, really idiotic thing that they say, the really idiotic thing is when they think that we've had industrialization and all of this technology because we have banking fraud, you know, because we have <laughs> banks creating money out of thin air. Look, we've invented right. the engine. Like, no, the engine was not invented by bankers making uh, money out of thin air. It was invented right. by people saving money, working in an industry and learning, innovating with property rights. That's how you get innovation. You don't get it through uh, basically inflation and leverage. That's it's it's ridiculous. And this this idea that more leverage it helps us finance more investment is so ridiculous because it's just it, it it destroys the concept of scarcity out there. Right. But it comes down to the fact that there is no alternative. I mean, there is a cabal in banking. You can't just set up a bank. You have to go to your competitors and ask them for permission to let you compete oh, yeah. against them. Yeah. And so that's why, obviously, they're not going to be happy about a model that is going to put them out of business. Wherein, you know, here's our bank. And the way it works is that it's completely immune to a bank run. So when any of your banks is ever going to be into a, in any trouble, everybody can come to ours and they can be sure that our bank will be solid. That's not going to be a winning pitch to the Federal Reserve. That's why all these banks always get rejected. Yeah, I think sort of the original sin here is that, you know, fractional reserve is bailout subsidized. And therefore, it can always outcompete full reserve because it has this, this extra source of profit, which is the periodic bailouts. And because it has that extra 
source of profit, sort of that government subsidy, it therefore pays to invest assets in you know, lobbying governments for special privileges. Essentially, as long as it is possible to lobby a government to interfere in the money supply, fractional reserve will always win that tournament. That is not a free market. That is a government market. That is, that, that is a competition um, you know, for, for rent seeking. And yes, I freely grant fractional reserve will always have an advantage in rent seeking because it is so profitable um, on the bailout uh, subsidies. And, you know, going back to the, the, the sort of free market question, I mean, one thing I just I think to sort of highlight is that it would take shockingly little to get rid of fractional reserve banking. You know, if you have a brokerage account and you started trading options, for example, in fact, sometimes when you open a brokerage uh, account at all, they will ask you suitability questions, right? They'll say things like, how long have you traded stocks? Uh, how often do you trade? They might even ask you knowledge-based questions, right? Like, do you know what an ETF is? All right. And the reason they do that, uh, in some cases, is mandate, but the reason they, they're, they're happy to do that is because that protects them in case you wipe out and there's like a lawsuit for negligence where they can say, well, no, we had, you know, we had a, a, a reason to believe that this person knew what they were doing. And in the US anyway, that suitability process is laid out. There's a specific FASB regulation. It's sort of buried deep in it. Uh, that is, at least from a regulatory perspective, that's where that thing comes from. But, but you know, the sort of suitability, what it's trying to do, that's something that has long existed in common law. In order to get rid of fractional reserve banking, really, that's all you have to do. On a nuts and bolts level, you just change that little FASB rule so that you say that it is including demand deposits that you know people are not presumed to understand fractional reserve and poof you know at that point the bank would have to sit down they'd have to actually you know give people some kind of knowledge test most people would have no idea what they're talking about uh, yeah. therefore uh, you know from a common law perspective they would not be qualified to bet in you know naked options or fractional reserve banking um, if George Soros walks in the room, then yes, he's qualified. Uh, I'm certain that he understands how fractional reserve banking works for a number of reasons. But normal people, you know, you would have a massive contraction just naturally under, you know, common law processes where, yes, you would have a fractional reserve banking system, but the only people participating in it would be in people who actually understand the risk. Which, by the way, at that point, if the thing crashes, you don't have nearly the sort of human shields that you have when our current banking system crashes, right? So, you know, we saw it in Living Color with uh, Silicon Valley Bank where, you know, all these VCs were, you know, they had their hat out begging and they were talking about, you know, the single mother in Ohio who's just trying to feed her family with Etsy. And they're very good at, you know, uh, sort of wheeling out the human shields to claim that, you know, they are the thin green line between us and the abyss. Uh, on the other hand, if you had a system where just through common law mechanisms, only sophisticated people were in fractional reserve, well, then we can, you know, see what that world would look like by looking at hedge funds, right? When a hedge fund crashes, nobody cares. They die alone as they should. And that's how it should work with bank collapses as well. If everybody there were, you know, sophisticated investors and rich guys, they wouldn't have the human shields. I think, uh, you know, my preferred way of getting rid of fractional reserve banking would be just to get rid of the FDIC or get rid of the Federal Reserve. If you didn't have a central bank, if you had hard right. money, and if you had a free market in banking, uh, then you just cannot have it. It'll die. And people here will bring up, oh, well, there was a central, there was fractional reserve banking in the 19th century. Yeah, and it kept on getting into crises and it kept on getting bailed out. And the only reason it continued to survive was because banking was not a free market. Yes, there was not a central bank. It wasn't quite the communist hellhole uh, that we have now. But that doesn't mean that it was a true free market. If it was a true free market, it would have been a lot better at handling fractional reserve banking and getting rid of it. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say I'm, I'm completely on board. Uh, you know, get rid of the FDIC, get rid of the Fed, um, completely there. I think that the trick with the FDIC is that is that human shields problem, right? So as long as grandma has her money in, you know, the Argentinian bond funds, when she thinks it's in a coffee can on the fridge, the political logic is just going to be completely irresistible. So even if you do fight long and hard, years long slog and kill the FDIC, It'll pop right back in in like six hours at the next bank crisis. Uh, the Fed, of I, course. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. If yeah. you kill the FDIC, but if you kill the Fed, if you don't have a Fed, then exactly you know, it doesn't matter what the grandma thinks. Either she's going to go bankrupt, or she's going to learn her lesson. 
either way, there's not going to be an FRB. There's not going to be fractional reserve banking. That's that's what I really can think. It's um, it's I mean, it's it's absurd when you think about it. Like there are all these startups that in the Silicon Valley example, they didn't want to take a risk with their payroll money. Like it's already a highly risky thing to get into a startup. And you already have the money. You know, you've gotten the funders. They've given you the money. You have payroll for the next six months. You have it in your bank account because you don't want to risk paying off your employees for the next six months. You want to stand by them. So that's the part of your business that you do not want to take risk in. And it's... It's, it's, it's really pernicious, and I discussed this in the fiat standard. What fiat does is that it takes away from people the ability to save. It takes away from them the ability to have a nest egg uh, where they can, you know, this is the thing that we don't risk. This is the thing that we keep in the most liquid, least risky thing so that we can maintain its value as much as possible into the future. If you have that, you can take risks with everything else. But we don't have that because, yep. as you said, you know, it's more important for bankers to be able to use you as a human shield for their hedge fund. And so what is, what's supposed to be your security is being gambled. And therefore, you are constantly insecure no matter what you do. And so you're just taking on more and more risk with this. And it's just completely unthinkable the idea that there's no market demand for banking as a simple bailment service you know? <laughs> sure, just right. keep my money there just keep my <laughs> yeah. money there yeah well and and you know we're seeing that in stable coins um you know stable coins don't pay interest and there th- there is a lot of money that is perfectly happy just to be stored uh in a stable coin a lot of it you know it's it's not all transactional a lot of it is actually sitting there durably so it starts to resemble uh dollar savings so we know just from the stable coin industry, you know, we can infer from Caitlin Long's application that uh, at least uh, competent entrepreneurs believed that there was a large market for that. So, and you know, of course, the easy way would just be, well, okay, Fed, um, Fed, OCC, you know, regulators, prove it, you know, allow it, and then see if the market actually wants it. And you know, we could say this with free bankers as well, who claim that fictional reserve has won the market test. Well, okay, prove it. So you guys, instead of sitting around defending fractional reserve, you advocate to free up the market. And then we'll see, you know, if people actually understand uh, bailment versus getting paid 0.15% to send your money off to Argentina, we'll see which one uh, grandma prefers. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, not holding my breath that they'll, uh, <laughs> they'll look into that. Yeah. All right, and don't want to hold you up anymore. No worries. Yeah, this was fun. I, I didn't expect it to go this long. I'm actually thrilled that it did. So yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about. So yeah, I really appreciate I it. I know. We definitely got to have you on again, and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of uh, <laughs> eventful things <laughs> taking place that are going to call for this. Jonathan Newman was talking about it. He said, um, you know, when the world collapses, it it's horrible, but it puts meat on the table for Austrians. So um, there's, there's, <laughs> there's some truth. To, I would prefer the world stop breaking, but um, yes, there is truth to that. Uh, when they screw things up, all of a sudden, you know, economists who understand how the world works become very in demand. Absolutely. I don't think we're going to be out of demand for a while. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. And, yeah, of uh, course. Best of luck on all you do. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to here. Put my uh, my battle face on. <laughs> All right, right Safety. Thank you for having me on. Really, seriously, I appreciate it.